Right, so um, we have uh, we have our electron beam hitting the sample. We generate a number of signals, which you'll probably be familiar with. Some of those are secondary electrons, backscatter electrons, visible light, OJ electrons, and on top of that, we also get X-rays, and that's that what I mean. that's what I would like to talk about in this presentation. Uh, characteristic X-rays and background radiation or brain Um so in that in, in SEM, that information uh, tells you about the elemental chemistry of your of your sample, which elements are present. Uh, you also get spatially resolved information, so it's very localized. Uh, the X-ray generation is only limited to a few microns, micro uh, your microns, and you can, if you think about it, you can excite extremely small volumes into into large chambers. Okay, so the first question is how are electrons generated? And they basically generated through two, through two types of interactions that the electrons and the code sample. Um, they're both inelastic due to inelastic scattering. One of them is an interaction with the nucleus, as indicated in this graphic here. And one of them is interactions with the electron cloud. So I'd like to cover uh, each of these in turn. So we start off by, by the generation of characteristic X-rays, and they are interactions with the electron cloud. So I've got this um, cartoon here, which shows an incoming electron interacting with uh, a patient or or orbital uh, and producing a vacancy. That could equally be an L-shell or an N-shell uh, orbital. But in this case, I've just illustrated a uh, generation of a patient vacancy. The, the atom becomes unstable, it doesn't like that, so it fills that vacancy from a higher orbit. So the, you have um, a difference in energy, and that energy can't just be lost, it is released as an X-ray. The energy of that X-ray will be the difference in energy between the two orbitals. So in this case, it's the difference between the, uh, the L-shell and the, the K-shell. Uh, if we look at a slightly more diagrammatical uh, representation, uh, that is not just a single transition that can occur, but we have a number of different sub-levels within the electron shell, and it could be filled, uh, that vacancy could be filled from a number of different options and uh, higher orders. Uh, so in other words, if you have a K-shell vacancy, you actually generate a, a series of lines, uh, um, equally, if you have if you happen to excite an L shell uh, orbital, then uh, that can be uh, filled from uh, higher orbits from from there. So again, you have a family of uh, L lines. So in the spectrum, what you'll see here is an example of iron. Uh, you can see um, the K shell lines here, and this peak uh, at about six and a half. K and V, uh, and then a series of K, K shells. So there's K alpha lines, K beta lines, all representing K shell transitions. And then there's also at a lower energy here, you can see the L shell transition. So that's typically what you would see in the spectrum. Similarly, for other elements, you have these are all uh, K lines from magnesium, aluminium, silicon, and those transitions would all occur at different energies. So um, each element has its own characteristic fingerprint in terms of the distribution of lines that you would see. <coughs> so that is uh, the generation of characteristic X-rays. Uh, the other X-rays you can generate are due to interactions with the uh, nucleus. And so this time the incoming electron is interacting with the nucleus. It's slowed down by uh, proximity to the nuclear field, so it loses energy, kinetic energy, and that kinetic energy uh, has to be accounted for in some way, uh, or the change in kinetic energy has to be accounted for, and that is released as an X-ray. So, and the energy of this particular X-ray can range from anything up to uh, zero to the beam energy, depending on about how much that X-ray is actually slowed down in that interaction. So what you see for that is you see a continuum where there's no characteristic peak 
for interactions with nucleus. So you see um, the backgrounds will be sitting on top of a non-characteristic background. And this is in fact what limits the detection in the raw EDS detectors. So because the peak has to be above this background before you can actually see it. Okay, so uh, how do we detect those X-rays? Uh, there's two two types of detectors that are commonly available. They are either we can measure the wavelength, uh, or we can measure the energy. So we have uh, energy wavelength and reciprocal have a reciprocal relationship. Um, and so if we measure the, the wavelength, uh, that the equivalent to measure the energy. Um, the wavelength dispersive detector is uh, it's got a lot more mechanical component. It's more complicated to set up, but it does have the advantage of uh, having a lower detection limit and, and, and better um, peak resolution. Um, we'll only be talking about the energy dispersive detector. Uh, so we'll be measuring the energy of the x-rays and how that works is well, there's several different detectors available. Uh, or there's the silicon lithium detector and the silicon drift detector. They really both work off the same uh, principle in many, way, in many ways. So I'm going to show you what that is. Uh, they both work on uh, the fact that the, the, the X-ray enters a silicon uh, matrix and it dissipates its energy and generates by interacting with the silicon atoms and it generates electron hole pairs. It promotes the electrons from the valence band into the conduction band. And the number of charges that it can that it generates is dependent on the energy of the incoming uh, X-ray. So in this case, uh, for a calcium X-ray, you would generate around about a thousand electron hole pairs, which corresponds to a charge of 1.6 by 10 to minus 16 kilograms appearing on this wire here. Um, well, what I didn't explain is that the crystal has a potential difference across it and that potential helps separate the charges so that negative charge appears on one side and positive charge go to the other side. So there's a charge of a very, a very small charge which is proportional to the energy of the x-ray that's coming in. So if we can measure that charge, we have a way of measuring the x-ray energy. Um, since this charge is so small, electrical charge, we need a, uh, there's a few components that we need to uh, process that signal. We have a preamplifier mounted very close to that crystal, which does the initial um, uh, um, detection so that there's no signal uh, or little or no signal is lost. Uh, that, pass, that, that signal, once it's gone through the preamplifier, is amplified further and then is then passed on to a multi channel analyzer. What that does is it assigns a fixed energy range, typically that would be uh, 10, to 10 or 20 EV, to each of a series of digital channels or bins. Um, so you can see the, uh, it's like a histogram, uh, so the first channel would be covering uh, minus 0.01 to 0.01 keV, the second channel would be 0.01 to 0.03 and so on. So if an oxygen x-ray happened to hit the crystal, which is at 0.526 keV, that's the energy required to generate uh, oxygen x-ray. Um, and that would then be counted in uh, channel 27, which represents the energy around 0.5, 0.53. If you have a silicon X-ray at 1.74 keV, that would then be collected or uh, added to channel 88, which would represent the uh, channel for that particular energy range, and so on. So the whole spectrum basically builds up in one go as you uh, detect the uh, as the X-ray gets detected. So what do you do with that information? Uh, there's, there's two ways, uh, there's two distinctions, uh, distinctions I make here. The information you collect is, uh, can either be qualitative 
or we can be quantitative. To explain a little bit more about what I mean by that, uh, or before I get into that, you may have to be aware of, uh, I should point out, you may need to be aware of some spatial relationships in your uh, detector. When you do analysis, uh, the sample should be at a very specific working distance uh, because that's the, the detector can only look at a particular point on the sample. Or, um, so, and that point is where the optic axis of the microscope coincides with the axis, the central axis of the EDS detector. And that working distance would be specified by the manufacturer. So if you're going to do extra analysis, you should be at that particular uh, working distance. Um, so what do you do with a spectrum? If you want to be qualitative, all that means is that you simply you collect the spectrum and you simply want to identify which elements are there. So typically uh, there's a library of peaks uh, for each element and you can match that uh, to the actual peaks you observe in, in, in the spectrum. So in this example, say for instance, I have the library shows that uh, the red lines is where iron should occur. So we have we could show the K alpha, K beta lines, and the L alpha lines, and we get a match. So we can now say with iron in the sample. Similarly for, for the other elements in, in my spectrum. So it's simply identifying what you have at specific locations. So you can have a sample with lots of uh, you know, backscattered images, and you're wondering what some of the different uh, uh, intensities of uh, what, what phases they represent. So you go to the first point, you collect the spectrum, that happens to have titanium, iron, and oxygen. And you might have a guess, if you, you usually know a little bit about the sample, and you might have a, a, a good guess that this might be uh, germinal. Uh, so for other areas, so there's a slightly darker region here, uh, you have aluminium, silicon, potassium, and, and you might have a guess, okay, I think that's my orthoclase. Similarly for some other uh, phases that you see, and you, you can pick out what you think that might be. But it's purely in a, in a qualitative fashion, and so you learn a little bit about, and more about where the various uh, phases are. So that, that would be a, a way of doing selected point analysis in your sample, just to find out what it is you might have in the sample. Uh, similarly, you might do uh, an X-ray map where you monitor specific uh, with the, the counts in specific regions of interest on the inner spectrum. So this would monitor the aluminium window, magnesium uh, window, uh, the iron K alpha peak, uh, and, and magnesium K alpha. So this tells you that if you look at this hexagonal brain in here, that it has a lot of aluminium, very little uh, magnesium. It's got a bit of iron. Uh, and a bit of manganese, and you can see the manganese and iron in the sun. So, again, a qualitative assessment of what's going on with your sample. So, uh, that's what I would consider uh, qualitative. Now, what do I mean by quantitative? Quantitative analysis is where you actually want to determine the weights and concentration of each of the elements in a particular part of your sample. And the nice thing is you can do this on a micron scale. Uh, so you can analyze very small areas and you can get compositional accuracy of one to 2% relative, providing the system is properly uh, calibrated. Uh, so some of you who have done X-ray analysis uh, using the EDS system, you might be aware there's a quantify button. You can certainly press that once you have a spectrum, but you probably should be aware of what the state of calibration of the system is. A lot of systems uh, come with a uh, standardless approach, uh, which can be very good in certain circumstances, but uh, it can also be quite bad in other cases. So the problem is you don't know when it's good and you don't know when it's bad. So um, I would argue that in many cases, it could be considered largely qualitative or semi-quantitative at best. So you just need to be very careful when you press that on the front button and know whether the system is properly calibrated or not. So what is actually the approach behind doing proper quantitative analysis? 
There's a guy called Pustang who, back in 1951, found, as part of his PhD thesis, found that if you use a pure element as a reference material and collect a spectrum, and you collect a spectrum on your unknown material, um, the, the ratio of the peak of, so in this case, element A in your unknown to the known reference standard, which is 100% iron in this case, is simply the intensity of the peak of element A in the unknown sample to the intensity of the peak in the pure element sample. So that ratio would be the first approximate of the weight point concentration of element A in your unknown. So how does that work in practice? Oh, what I, what I should point out is um, it is assumed that the acquisition conditions are exactly the same for both your standard and the unknown specimen. Uh, so what do I mean by that? I mean that when you collect the spectra, the accelerating voltage has to be the same, the probe current should be the same, the working distance should be the same, and the detector response should be the same. Basically, that means you can't just collect a spectrum in one system and a collection a spectrum in a different system and then try and uh, compare the two spectra. Uh, also, the sample should be flat and polished, better than half a micron. It is expected the sample is clean. The sample should be coated. If it's a non conductor, we typically would uh, think coated with carbon. And it's expected that the sample is homogeneous on a five micron scale or more. So, um, so how does that actually, how do you actually calculate that ratio? So here again, I have my unknown and my reference standard. What we do, I'll take you just, I'll take you through one example for, for one element and basically we do the same for each element as before. Um, so on the right, we have our reference standard and we measure, simply measure the counts in that peak. Uh, of course, we have to take away the background, which is non characteristic. And so in this case, um, the reference standard has 72,000 odd counts and the unknown material under the same condition only records 11,000 or so counts. So the ratio that we end up with is called the K ratio because we're using K lines. That's where the terminology stems from. It is 11,000 over 72,000. So that's about 0.153. Or the first approximation that we end up with is 15.3 weight percent in that particular uh, unknown. Now, I happen to know that the unknown is a garnet, which is just a mineral, and I know the reported weight percent value is in fact 18.09. So the question now is, okay, why doesn't this work? Why, why can't you take a simple ratio? The reason for that is that the standard and the unknown don't have the same compositions. So there's a, the, the way the electron being scatters in the sample and the ways way the, uh, the X-rays scatter uh, in the sample is different between the unknown and the standard. And um, what that means is that you have to apply a correction which is based on the differences in the matrix. So what are these matrix corrections? Well, first of all, there are atomic number effects. The average atomic number of the sample is unlikely to be the same between, or is often not the same between the sample and the unknown. And so if we look at the atomic number alone, if we have a higher atomic number, the interaction volume will be smaller. If we have a lower atomic number, the interaction volume volume will be bigger. So that if there's more scattering at lower atomic number, we can generate more extracts. If the interaction volume is smaller, we have fewer extracts. So that alone will change the ratio of the interest that we generate for any given element. Same, another effect of atomic number is the backscatter factor. So if you have a high atomic number, you get lots of uh, electrons backscattered, BSEs. If you have a low atomic number, you have far fewer BSEs. That means that in the high atomic number material, there's fewer electrons available for creating electrons. Show you have fewer X rays uh, being generated in the high tone number versus a low tone. Um, so that covers uh, atomic number factors. Now, absorption um, X rays don't just 
uh, x-rays are generated depth and they need to travel through the sample to get to the x-ray detector. If the composition of the material is different, in, of the standard and the known is different, the amount of absorption is also going to be different. So uh, there are differences in the way, uh, in the number of x-rays that were recently detected from the material. And finally, there are fluorescence factors that uh, you can generate an x-ray A uh, at depth, and before it exits a sample, it actually encounters atom B and fluoresces a, uh, an x-ray from element B, and it's the element uh, x-ray from element B that will be detected at the expense of element A. So uh, that will also change or affect the ratio of the atomic measure. So these atomic number, absorption, and uh, fluorescence effects can all be calculated and they can be combined to correct the initial estimate that we had from our k ratio. So that the final concentration then becomes, which is uh, so denoted as CA here, as the k ratio times your SAC correction factors. So in my example here, um, which I showed you before, um, of iron in a garnet, our initial estimate was 15.3. Uh, I won't go through the details, but it turns out the ZAP corrections are about 1.19. And if you multiply those together, in this case, your final estimate or your final estimate uh, or your final concentration turns out to be 18.21. So if we now compare that to the known composition, we're actually within 0.6% of the true concentration of the accepted value that we know should be. And then we apply that, basically that's applied for all the other, that approach is applied for all the other uh, elements as well. To get the total 8% concentration for all the elements. Uh, there are some uh, practical considerations here. Um, Matrix corrections are actually an iterative thing because as we apply the ZAP correction, the composition changes, we need to recalculate those corrections and uh, apply a new correction and up to three or four times that converging and converges into the final concentration. Uh, the standards that we use are often a combination of compound materials uh, rather than uh, pure elements. Uh, they can be pure elements, but generally, it works better if we try and match the composition of the standard as close as possible to the unknown if possible. Uh, that way we minimize the amount of correction we have to apply to get the, the right answer. Um, we, we don't do a comparison of the unknown and the standard every time we do uh, uh, analysis. Often these, the reference calibrations are done well ahead of time uh, and stored. And so they can just be recalled, and all you have to do is collect the unknown and um, the, uh, all the information that you need to do this um, uh, quantitative analysis is, is, is really good. Uh, now, some of you may be aware of uh, microprobe, electron microprobe uh, techniques, and with a carefully calibrated EDS system, we can actually get uh, results which are comparable to what you might get in a microprobe uh, for minor and major uh, elements. So this is uh, some analysis that we've done on a geological material, feldspar, uh, over eight analysis on EDS, eight analysis on WDS. And as you can see, for most of the analysis, the EDS analysis are within error of the uh, WDS uh, results. Um, there's another one here for planar paroxene. Again, the results are, are very similar. In fact, some, uh, okay. oh, and also the, the, the WDS and EDS analysis, uh, certainly from major elements, have very similar decisions as well. Uh, there's another one. Again, as you can see, we get very good data uh, in a well calibrated uh, EDS system. So to summarize, um, Energy dispersive analysis in the SM is a very powerful, non-destructive analytic technique uh, that can be used to explore uh, the, character, 
characteristics of your material in the CM. Uh, if an EDS system is properly calibrated against known reference standards, it's, it's possible to perform uh, very high quality quantitative uh, analysis. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for, for watching the presentation. And, uh, those are uh, some of the questions answered. Yeah,